Hi, this is Marlene and a warm welcome from Glasgow, Scotland to all around the world. In this series of Marlene and Friends, I'll be sharing with you the most amazing group of people who have all the skills and expertise to make our world one of health and peace for all who live here, humans and non-humans alike. My guest today, Dr John McDougall, is a physician and nutrition expert who teaches better health through vegetarian cuisine. Dr McDougall has been studying, writing and speaking out about the effects of nutrition on disease for over 30 years. I absolutely love John McDougall's no-nonsense approach to health. He's a man of great stature. He keeps the flame of truth burning bright. His own journey with ill health actually saved his life and that's why you should all keep on aiming high. His story is quite frankly breathtaking. Dr McDougall is the founder and director of the nationally renowned McDougall Programme, which is a 10-day residential programme that he and his wife Mary McDougall host at a resort in Santa Rosa, California. Hi, I'm Marlene watson Tara in Service for a Healthy World. Today I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Dr John McDougall, a man of truth, and the truth is so simple and easy to understand. Dr McDougall is a physician and nutrition expert who teaches better health through vegetarian cuisine. He's been studying, writing and speaking out about the effects of nutrition on disease for over 30 years. Dr McDougall, a warm welcome from a cold and snowy Scotland. How are things over there in California? Well, it's cold. It's cold. And, and it's cold and we're finally getting some rain. Okay. And, uh, uh, you know, snow comes very rarely where I live, except if you go up to the mountains, you can do some skiing. Yeah. But not, it, it's nice weather here. Okay. And, but we just got through a horrible drought. In fact, a drought that continues. It's a drought that is A drought that is caused in large part by the food industry. Exactly. And we're having all the flooding, so you guys get no water. And Scotland, has massive floods going on all over uh, the north of England as well right now. It's really serious. People have had to leave their homes, thousands and thousands. So, yeah, so the work that you're doing is is not only for human health, it's environmental health, it's about animal, you know, um, cruelty, and, and it's just all under the one umbrella. But the first thing I want to say, apart from your book, The Start Solution, which is an international bestseller, the Dr. McDougall Colour Picture Book is simply genius. It's genius, and, and I want you to share with us all the inspiration. Where did it come from to write that? Well, the Dr. McDougall's Colour Picture Book on food poisoning yep. and how to cure by eating corn, beans, rice, potatoes, uh, it came about because people don't read. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I just... I've written 12, 12 national best-selling books. I write a monthly newsletter. And the kind of feedback that I get is just people don't have time to read. They've got these little devices that they look at, and they look at pictures and uh, short sentences. And so I was in uh, Costa Rica uh, last year on our, uh, our uh, McDougal adventure trip. We take about 100 people, maybe more, uh, to some destination. And uh, we serve them good food. And that gives me a little uh, extra time when I'm on these trips to think of new things. And during that trip in June of 2014, I believe, yeah, June, no, June 2014, so it's more than a year ago, uh, I um, decided what I was going to do is put together a colored picture book so people didn't have to read. Hi, wonderful. And just look at pictures and short sentences. And I put this uh, colored picture book on my website. Uh, so anybody who wants to can, can view it in a matter of probably 10 minutes. And I also offered it to people to translate it into other languages. And so it's in 22 languages. Wow. And uh, it, it's, it's a simple way of seeing the problem. Uh, what I try to explain to people is that uh, they're being poisoned. Uh, this is food poisoning. It would be analogous to somebody having lead poisoning or salmonella poisoning. They're taking in toxic substances that are making their body sick, and they're taking these substances on a daily basis. And the only way to get over food poisoning is you have to stop poisoning yourself. And so uh, one of the things I had to do was to simplify it so people could uh, take action. It's really hard when somebody tells you to change your diet. You know, there are so many different rules, and sure. you don't know quite how to identify the foods. Is this okay, or can I eat a little bit of that, or this? And so I simplified it to the to a point uh, where I would take care of a person just like I would if they had a, a poisoning due to, say, t tobacco. Okay. Tobacco poisoning. Well, you're just one simple thing. You just quit smoking the cigarettes. 
or if somebody had alcohol poisoning. They do just one simple thing. They would uh, stop taking in the alcohol poison. So what I did is I put the poisons into two simple categories. Uh, one category is animal foods. That means eating cows and chickens and pigs and fishes and snails and you know the, the byproducts of these animals like cheese and yogurt and so on. So one category of food poisons, so you can easily identify it, is animal foods. Yeah. And then the second category of food poisoning is vegetable oil. Uh, this, this oil is uh, uh, fattening. The fat you eat is the fat you wear. It's very toxic. It's toxic to the arteries. It's toxic to the cells. Fats and oils promote cancer more than any other component of the diet. So the two categories of poison are animal foods and oils. And when people first hear this, they go, well, there's nothing left to eat. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I, got nothing, I got no food. <laughs> I hear it all the time as well. Uh, so I go on with I go on in, in the book and I explain to you what you do eat. And the most important concept, and that's why I named the book The Starch Solution, the most important concept is your food is starch. Yeah. It always has been. In Scotland, it was what, barley? Yeah, exactly. It was barley a big food. Uh, certainly they made uh, many breads. And, mm -hmm. uh, so I, 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 I made the statement, I make it every place I go, and I did it at this, this portion of the color picture book, as I explained, your food is starch. That would be things like rice and corn and beans and oatmeal and uh, barley. and uh, That's the food that people need to eat is starch. And people love starches. They've just been told that starch is bad for them. They've been told that starch will make you fat and make you sick. And, and that's the key piece of information that has to be straightened out. Otherwise, people cannot go forward. Uh, starches don't make you fat. Uh, even though people say, don't eat, don't eat rice. Only rice turns to sugar, which turns to fat, which makes you fat. And then you just stop them. You say, wait a minute. Yeah. Let's talk about rice eaters for a minute. I mean, there are 2 billion rice eaters in Asia. And up until recently, how many of them were fat? Exactly. There are none. None are fat. So yeah. how do you go get off saying that you shouldn't eat starch, like rice, because it makes you fat, and you can't find any fat people that live on starch? <laughs> So the, uh, the color picture book goes into define your diet. It's a diet based on starch. I mean, 90% of your diet should be starch. That's what it used to be in Asia. Yeah. Before 1935 in China, 90% of their food came from rice. Of course, now the, the Asians, the Chinese, have become very wealthy, and they've decreased their rice intake and they have doubled their intake of animal foods and oils. Yeah. And if you're familiar with what's happening in Asia, you notice that the people are getting very fat and obese. Absolutely. Same thing, same thing in, in India. Uh, now uh, uh, about half the middle class of India uh, is overweight or obese. And this just all just happened in the last 35 years. So it's an observation that people can make uh, who are, uh, are worldly in, in their travels and their understanding. They can make a simple observation of themselves. 35 years ago, there were very few fat people, but now that we're richer mm -hmm. and we have better distribution of the rich foods and industry is playing a bigger part, feeding us uh, more meat, more oil, yeah. more dairy, at a cheaper price, uh, what's happened is you see the world is fattening all over the place, not just, not just England or Scotland or other parts of Europe or the United States, but it's happening in Africa. Absolutely. It's happening in Asia. So anyway, the color picture book tells you you should eat starch, and then tells you you can have some non-starch green and yellow vegetables. Uh, the reason I emphasize some uh, is because there's a whole movement out there of people who are trying to become vegan, vegetarian, nutritarians. Uh, they're trying to live off green and yellow vegetables like kale and broccoli and cauliflower, and, and they're, they feel terrible. They're starving to death. Yeah. You can't get enough calories. And they wonder, what's wrong? I can't, I can't eat this way. Well, you can't get enough calories. These aren't foods intended to power your body. These are foods that may add some color, some interest, a few extra nutrients. But it starts that you have to have the satisfaction to get your, your strength up. Um, so I emphasize in the next part that you are not to eat um, as a center of your diet, non-starchy green yellow vegetables, and then next, I tell people they can eat a little fruit. It's okay, but to live on fruit alone is something very few people have done. They're called fruitarians. Yeah. I know. It just doesn't cut it. So you have to get the starch concept. 
that the most of your diet, 80, 90 percent of your diet needs needs to come from potatoes or sweet potatoes or rice or barley or oatmeal or we you don't know, pick your starch doesn't matter mix and match it has to be from starch and. Um, and I explain to them in more detail in the color picture book. I explain to them about food poisons and show them pictures of food poisons like beef and chicken and fish and shellfish and butter and cheese. And these are the food poisons. And they're really rather, I, I deliberately pick the pictures to not make them appealing. Uh, they're really, if you look at the meat and the dairy, I mean, this is just yellow and brown food. Yeah, absolutely. It's quite, quite disgusting to make a, a, a meat or dairy dish uh, appealing, eye appealing. You have to add. Uh, green and yellow vegetables to the to the dish, otherwise you know, it's just bland. And then I follow in the color picture book with uh, many pictures of meals that I eat, uh, various kinds of soups and stews and pasta dishes, and show them how appealing, eye appealing that is. And uh, of course, when people start to think about the the taste, uh, they realize what they enjoy eating is salt. That's the way you get people to eat uh, chicken, and lamb, and Beef is you have to cover it up with salt and sugar and spice. Otherwise, they, they, they can't eat it. It's bland, disgusting. And uh, <clears throat> so we allow uh, on our meal plan these same adulterants, these same things that enhance the taste of the food, uh, but it's not for the purpose of covering up flavors. Exactly. It's to enhance it. Yeah, corn naturally tastes good. Potatoes naturally taste good. Anyway, and I'll show you a whole bunch of pictures of... Uh, of uh, uh, the kind of foods that we eat. And then I also present in the short color picture book the results that we've gotten from uh, our scientific research. I show how in seven days we've uh, been able to get people to lose on average. We're talking about 1,615 people that are in this study. It's published in the Nutrition Journal. You can get it online. The average weight loss eating as much food as you want for seven days is uh, 3.1 pounds, which would be you know, a, a kilogram and a half. And uh, they dropped their cholesterol on average of about 23 milligrams per deciliter, which would be about three quarters of an international unit. And they dropped their blood pressure about eight over four millimeters of mercury. And their blood sugars uh, stay about the same. But we have to realize during the seven day period, I, as a physician, mm -hmm. have uh, these people with diabetes and high blood pressure reduce or stop their medication 90% of the time. Wonderful. They're able to reduce or stop the medication and yet maintain better blood pressures and better blood sugars. So the results are, are uh, present in the color picture book. I also show results we did for a year-long period. Uh, Oregon Health and Science University Medical School in Portland studied our patients. Mm -hmm. And at one year, this is a randomized, uh, rate-blinded controlled trial. And at one year, they found that 85% uh, that, uh, of people adhered to the diet 100% of the time. They found an average maintained weight loss of 20 pounds and an average maintained uh, uh, cholesterol drop of 20 points. Now you can convert those to yeah. uh, kilograms international units, so I'll let you do that. But <laughs> these were permanent and profound uh, uh, accomplishments for a year-long period of time. So people will permanently change their diet and get permanent results. If you do it this way, if you do it by starving yourself on uh, portion control diets or making yourself sick on these uh, low-carbohydrate low diets like the Atkins diet and the wheat belly diet and the grain brain diet. Yeah, that was my next question for you actually because these books are driving me insane. Everybody's quoting them constantly and they demonize all grains and all carbohydrates, all starches. Right. And I wanted you to touch on that if you would because these people are trying to convince the world that carbohydrates make you fat, just what you said right. earlier. So. Dr. McDougall, can you enlighten everybody again on the fact that this is just absolute nonsense? Well, you know, as, as we were talking about before, you can prove it's nonsense yeah. just by looking around the world, just by looking through history. Look yeah. at your uh, your religious text. Exactly. Whether it's the Quran or the Bible. They warn against the eating meat and they tell you that yeah. uh, uh, the grain is the staff of life. Mm -hmm. It's always been that way. This is common knowledge because it's true. Well, uh, about 100 years ago, uh, uh, some weight loss gurus uh, were interested in ways of losing weight. And they found that if you cut out all the starch, that you would uh, go into ketosis and get actually in a state of sickness, and uh, you would lose weight. And it became very famous with the Atkins diet back in the 1970s. 
is that Atkins taught, Robert Atkins taught a diet of uh, bacon, butter, and brie. And when you have no carbohydrate, your body resorts to uh, a metabolism known as ketosis. Sure. And you produce ketones, and they cause you to lose your appetite. Mm -hmm. And as a result, uh, you lose weight. And they also, once you stop eating carbohydrate, your body metabolizes the carbohydrate in your body. And so two pounds of carbohydrate that's stored as glycogen disappear immediately. So you get two pounds of weight loss from losing the glycogen in, the in, the, in, in a couple of days. And those two pounds of glycogen are associated with four pounds of water. So somebody goes on these low-carb diets, and uh, uh, what they see is in four, five, six days, they've lost six, eight pounds. You go, wow, what a miracle. And then they go into ketosis, and if they can stay in ketosis, uh, they get sick to the point where they can't eat much food. And they continue to lose weight, but you can't stay on that kind of diet because you can't stay sick permanently. Absolutely. And the same thing with the starvation. You can't stay starving permanently. Well, Atkins had his, uh, his run, uh, actually twice uh, in the 70s and in the uh, 90s. Uh, he went out, so to speak, uh, and people started realizing the, uh, uh, the insanity of this kind of eating. Uh, you're eating foods that are known to cause uh, heart disease and cancer and diabetes. Well, this is a proven fact. This is, this is information that's incorporated in the U.S. Dietary Guidelines, which came out yesterday. So people realized these foods were making them sick. Uh, they started seeing uh, videos of factory farming and how they raise chickens and cows and pigs and slaughter them. And, you know, that's, that's something even the, the uh, staunchest person would find nauseating. And they started thinking about where their food comes from. And uh, then they, recently people have become aware over the last uh, 10 years that what we're eating is destroying the planet. Uh, livestock accounts for more than half the global warming gases. Yeah. And so they think, well, listen, should I be eating a diet that makes people sick, uh, uh, causes horrible pain in animals, and is destroying our children's future? So the Atkins kind of thinking went out, and the only way I see that it could get this kind of nonsense back in is to basically lie to the public. Yeah. They, would not, they would not put out a book called uh, eat more animals to lose weight. Exactly. It wouldn't sell. So what, what they've done, as I see it, is they put up what's called wheat belly. Yeah. Don't eat wheat. Well, this is a backdoor approach to telling you mm -hmm. the Atkins diet. The same thing with grain brain. Yeah. Clearly, if you, if you read these people, these authors, they are teaching you a, a ketone-producing diet. They are teaching you the bliss of ketosis. Uh, but they just did it in a, in a backwards way. Anyway, I know I've actually had clients, women that were on these diets, Dr. McDougall, that bought the books, that swore by the books, and then they come to me because they don't feel well, you know. And of course, what do I teach? I teach exactly the same. It's all grains, beans, whole. It's whole foods. So then, you know, the first couple of days on, if it's a retreat or a course they're on with me, they say, "Oh, this rice is making me feel fat and bloated," and you know, because they've they've killed the metabolism. So for me, healthy eating is in. Dieting is out. It has to go. It doesn't work. So. You know, the other question that I wanted you to uh, I wanted to ask you was, why do you think the world has gone crazy on gluten-free? Gl everything's gluten-free. Yeah. Well, people are desperate. <clears throat> and uh, they're looking for a solution, a, 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 a new trick, a new gimmick to uh, get their health back. Uh, there is a problem uh, for some people with gluten. Mm -hmm. They have something called celiac disease. And fewer than 1% one, 1 of the population has this trouble. And people with celiac disease uh, are usually quite thin because uh, they don't absorb nutrients in their bowel well. So right. one of the characteristics of a person with celiac disease is they're, they're, they're thin. And uh, they have to stay away from wheat, barley, and rye. And when they do, they gain weight. But of course, the public has interpreted exactly the opposite. <laughs> wheat, barley, and rye, they think they're making you gain weight. But. And so you need to get away from it. It's just the opposite of a celiac patient. Well, anyway, they're looking for something, some, some miracle, some answer that hasn't been answered and so they have picked on wheat, barley, and rye as being the uh, the devils and when you go into stores in the United States 30 to 40 percent of the products are labeled gluten-free. I know it's crazy. And they're gluten-free donuts and gluten-free cookies and gluten-free junk and people gain weight going on gluten-free diets. Yeah they do. Because they're eating gluten-free junk. Now this does a disservice to people with celiac disease because mm -hmm. uh, uh, folks don't take celiac disease serious anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, you go into a restaurant, say a person with celiac disease, you go into a restaurant and you say, look, I have celiac disease, I can't have wheat barley or rye, and the waiter brings out a soup with gluten, with, with 
croutons on the soup. And the, the person says, look, this is wheat. I'm going to get sick if I eat this. And Boyer says, ah, don't bother. The last 40 people who were in here who had said they had uh, uh, gluten intolerance, celiac disease, I put the croutons on and they didn't complain. So you're really taking away the seriousness of avoiding wheat, wheat barley, and rye for somebody who does have celiac yeah. disease. So <clears throat> that's the problem. But the real problem with this is uh, that folks are looking for wheat, barley, and rye as the answer to their health problems. And it distracts them from where their attention should be. Mm -hmm. Their attention needs to be at stopping the livestock consumption. Because as I just mentioned, we're destroying the planet with all yeah. of this livestock. Which brings into another matter, which you may not approve of me talking about, but I will, and that's the GMO issue. Mm -hmm. This is another deadly distraction. Oh, absolutely. What we should be doing. I mean, GMO is, this, you know, it's frankenfood. It, uh, yep, I agree. It just doesn't, doesn't sound right, but I've never seen anybody suffer from GMO disease. Mm -hmm. So we're all chasing around the GMO issue. We're not paying attention to the fact that we're killing ourselves and the animals, and our planet by not focusing our entire attention on the livestock, which is the problem. Yeah, exactly. I know. I mean, that's a big passion of mine. Um, you know, first and foremost, what makes me jump out of bed in the morning and has done for decades is the animals. I say I'm vegan, but not in a way that I promote the vegan diet because vegan diets, to me, are full of... There's enough sugar in it to rot, rot the tusks off an elephant. You know, it's uh, so many... You know, when Bill and I were teaching recently at the other Veg Fest one in Edinburgh, it was filled with cupcakes and cookies and cakes. I mean, there wasn't a vegetable in sight. So I push myself out as a vegan in terms of the animals, and it's the passion I have in my heart for that and the environmental issues. And, of course, the health that I, that I teach and I have taught for years. But the vegan diets, for me, are they lack hugely in, in nutrition. And I see a lot of vegan people that are overweight too, you know, and they, they have a lot of digestive problems. And they have all these fake meats, you know, and the fake meat industry is growing bigger and bigger all the time. You think, what's wrong with rice and beans and potatoes and vegetables? It's just another way of making another multi-billion dollar industry, yeah? That's it. That, what's, what's wrong with rice and corn and beans yeah. and vegetables is you can grow them in your backyard. Absolutely. And, and they cost almost nothing. You go to the big markets like Costco and you find, uh, you know, 50 pounds of rice you can get for like $25 and uh, you can get uh, 20 pounds of beans for $12. And so it's really cheap food, inexpensive, inexpensive. And, uh, but and it's the nutrition people need. It's just like people ate 40 years ago. I mean, their diets were grains and beans and uh, uh, two tubers and potatoes. There are, I'm sure, a lot of people in your part of the world who uh, are still alive from the years of World War II. Post my little year. mom, who's 90, is like a girl, Dr. McDougall. She's amazing. She's 90. She's my biggest fan. She says, why is the world not listening to you, Marley? And, uh, you know, like, um, she's been the same as some of her friends. They're all in that age group now because they were, you know, pre-war babies. They didn't have the diet that people have today, you know. They're, they've got better mm -hmm. health. Um, and the, the population here is so aging radically now that it's quite scary, you know. New folks, old folks' homes are opening up everywhere. It's a massively growing industry over here. I don't know about the States, but here, oh, yeah. that's the newest industry. And, of course, everything in the UK and in Scotland in particular is free. You don't pay for medicine. You don't pay for consultants, doctors, hospitals, operations, pills, drugs. Everything's free. Incredible. Well, you'd think somebody in the government would figure out the way to cut expenses would be to keep people healthy and start giving um, proper dietary advice. Well, I write to them all the time, and I'm sure they'll probably get a hitman out to me one of these days. <laughs> well, Europe is actually uh, quite well studied during World War II and yeah. World War I. And we have uh, excellent data on disease incidents uh, during you know, that, that period of time. Yep. What, what, down. So Cancer went down. Everything went down. Yep. During the Di rationing. Diabetes mortality decreased in Wales and England during World War I. Yeah. And same thing during World War II, heart disease, multiple sclerosis, all these common diseases uh, became rare. 
and it's so true what you say, you know, the world is eating off the king's table and that's where the sickness and, and uh, disease comes from. I mean, in China, I, I think I remember the last time we looked at, you know, research and statistics, they are now the, the capital of disease, uh, diabetes in the world. And in the 80s, they only had 1% of the population with diabetes. And I have friends that I've studied with that are doctors of Chinese medicine and they're always trying to take my books and my work there. But there you go. Is your picture book in Chinese yet? Uh, I think it is. It's yeah, great... yeah, because the Chinese love pictures and they said they wouldn't translate my um, cookbook because it needed to have more pictures. <laughs> they wanted more pictures. So so that you've got yours in, in there. Okay, um, your McDougal programs, which are phenomenal, phenomenal. I know uh, I know some people that have been on them and you run retreats twice a year as well to other, other destinations. Can you tell me about them? Yeah. Well, I run a 10-day program uh -huh. for so a med medical-based program. I or other physicians who work with me. Uh, they take care of people and we take them off their unnecessary medications, which are most of their medications. And, uh, and we teach them how to eat well, monitor them, and we do that over a 10 day period of time with a tremendous amount of education, eye opening education. Yeah. And then we have weekends, so we have uh, intense weekends where we just teach our message. And then we have something called an advanced study weekend where I bring in experts uh, who have a similar message or one a message that's very important for people to hear. Like uh, we, but this, this uh, week, it'll be February 12th through 14th, uh, 2016, we have uh, T. Colin Campbell coming back and we have Dr. Esselstyn with us and Michael Greger and a whole bunch of new people that are uh, in a similar line of thinking. Not exactly the same, but similar line of thinking. We do those twice a year, and then we have uh, adventure trips where we take people to various parts of the world, like uh, the end of January, we're taking a group to Kauai, Hawaii. And, oh, do you need uh, someone to wash the dishes? I was married. That's where Bill and I were married in Kauai. It's so beautiful. Yeah, uh, I'll come and do the dishes. <laughs> okay. And then we had we are taking a, a whole boatload of people to uh, Alaska Nice. on, on a National Geographic uh, uh, type of expedition, a very small boat, but mm -hmm. Fantastic. It'll be a lot of fun. That's beautiful. So we take, we take them on adventure trips, mm -hmm. and um, then outside of the, uh, the things that cost money, I also put out a free newsletter every month, and I do a webinar every week, which people watch all over the world, and uh, put out uh, other messages to folks to try and, like yesterday, the dietary guidelines for the United States came out. Which, uh, of course, are heavily influenced by the, the food industry. Sure. But I did point out uh, some of the some of the counterbalance that was in there. Uh, you know, when they talked about fish, they talked about methyl mercury poisoning, mm -hmm. how dangerous it is. And then they talked about dairy and meat. They talked about cholesterol saturated fat, and even made a statement that uh, that you should eat as little cholesterol as possible. Wow. Which means which means you eat no animal foods because yeah. cholesterol is only in animal foods. So I put out messages to uh, my listening public, which is about 100,000 people. Uh, when do events come out? Uh, I would encourage people to go to my website. You'll be surprised about how the website is essentially free. Uh, you'll find maybe four or five hundred recipes. You'll find uh, all kinds of articles I've written on diabetes, multiple sclerosis, etc. Uh, lots, lots of free things there. We also have. Um, we have a, uh, a cookbook app that's not free, but very inexpensive uh, that you can get. And uh, yeah, it, it's a good experience for you. You spend, you spend months reading there, and people come to me all the time. They say, well, where's the gimmick? I can't find the gimmick in your, in your website. And we do sell things like adventure trips and our uh, programs, and we have books. I have 12 national best-selling books. So, yeah, we do have a commercial aspect to it, but you could go there and get all the information you want. Yeah. Uh, nothing hidden and at no cost at all. Well, and you ask, you ask, why do I do that? Well, the reason I did it in the beginning is that nobody would buy, buy my stuff, so I had to give it away. <laughs> but but the, real reason, the real reason is this, is that Mary and I, Mary and I were given a gift uh, about 40 years ago of uh, knowledge that has kept us healthy and trim. You know, we're nearly 70 years old. It's kept us healthy and trim. And because we were given this gift, we, we, we always wanted to give back. Yeah. You know, giving is better than receiving you here. Yeah. Making, making, helping other people is where you get uh, 
joy in life and satisfaction. So we've had an opportunity to help lots of people to give a lot. And the return has been huge for us. Well, it's well deserved, you know, and as I've said at the very beginning of the interview, you know, when I first, um, I don't know, I've known about you for such a long time, and um, you do speak the truth, you're a man of integrity, and, and there's um, there's such a beautiful um, light in your soul because, you know, you do want to do good work in the world, and you, of course you do, or you wouldn't be continuing to do what you do daily, and I think it's just about, you know, keeping, you know, having your spirit your spirit of adventure, which is wonderful, never waning and just constantly moving forward year after year, you know, and um, I wish you and Mary the world's growth this year in 2016 for all your programs and courses. And the next time I'm, I'm in California, I have to come to Santa Rosa and, and meet you. Yeah, that'd be nice. And, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll buy you lunch. Oh, there you go. That's fantastic. That's a good offer. I can't refuse. So, Dr. McDougall, thank you so much. Um, I'm really thrilled that you took the time to just share your wisdom with all of us again. And hopefully you'll lighten up Scotland and the UK and the whole of Europe and everywhere else in the world that's listening because we need you and um, we, need, we need people like you changing the world for all of the future generations to come. So, thank you. Right. I would, uh, I would encourage them, and you've given me the opportunity to do so, uh, to go to my website, yeah. which is uh, drmcdougall.com, spelled D-R-N-C-D-O-U-G-A-L-L.com, or just look up my, my name. I'm very prominent uh, on the Internet. And just spend some time there. Start with the Color Picture Book. Yeah, that's an uh, absolute perfect place to start. It's a wonderful idea. Thank you so much, Dr. McDougall. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.